Okay, so we're going to start now. Cordial greetings and welcome to the 2020 Virtual International Congress of Neuroscience. For me, it is a pleasure to coordinate this scenario of knowledge exchange. My name is Lina Munoz and along with Valeria Mendoza, we will be moderating this session. The topic of this session is aesthetic world, experience, empathy and communication in COVID-19 time and our scientific perspective. The session will, be, will have a total duration of 60 minutes that will be distributed in 40 to 45 minutes for the presentation and then 10 minutes for the questions. We encourage you to share your questions as they come and to make them through the questions button and not through the chat button. They will be read at the end of the presentation. We will begin with the presentation of Professor Vittorio Valese, who is Doctor of Medicine and a trade neurologist. He's a professor of psychobiology and cognitive neuroscience at the Department of Medicine and Surgery of the University of Parma, Italy. A young senior research scholar from the Department of Art, History and Archaeology of the Columbia University, New York. He's also an honorary fellow of the Institute of Philosophy of the School of Advanced Study at the University of London and an Einstein fellow at the Berlin School of Mind and Brain of Humboldt University. Professor Galese is also a cognitive neuroscientist. His research focuses on the relation between the sensory motor system and cognition by investigating the neurobiological and bodily grounding of intersubjectivity, psychopathology, language, and aesthetics. He is the author of more than 300 scientific publications and three books. Um, okay, so now I will ask our special guest if he included the recording authorization and declaration in his presentation. Hi, good morning to everyone. It's a pleasure being in Colombia uh, for the first time, although unfortunately uh, virtually. Uh, I will show you um, the first two slides, the authorization for recording audiovisual content, which I give, of course, and my declaration uh, uh, that there is no conflict of interest. Okay, perfect. So do you agree with this statement contained in this slide uh, regarding the recording a use of audiovisual material? Yes, of course. Okay. And do you have a conflict of interest to declare? No, I'm not. I have not. Okay. Well, without further ado, let's welcome Professor Vittorio Galesi. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to this session. Um, the focus uh, of my talk will be on the aesthetic world. And from my uh, very uh, particular vantage point, which is that of a cognitive neuroscientist, uh, I will try to deal with our relationship uh, um, uh, with images, which I take to be uh, one of the key issues that uh, enable us to understand uh, um, the world uh, uh, we are living in. Uh, the, the type of experience of the world uh, uh, that we do every day uh, as soon as uh, our relation to the world uh, uh, is mediated uh, uh, within um, the digital uh, media scale. This is uh, going to be the outline of my talk. I will uh, uh, give you a definition of aesthetics and of the aesthetic world. Then I will move on uh, uh, the topic of how can we possibly embody images. Uh, of course, we can entertain uh, with images, and I will confine myself to man-made images. Uh, we can entertain a variety of relations uh, um, uh, with images. Uh, embodiment is one of them, and I will focus uh, specifically on this basic way of engaging uh, with images, which is uh, embodied simulation. Uh, my model of perception and imagination, uh, which is greatly fueled by uh, empirical research uh, in neuroscience done by myself with my colleagues and by many other colleagues around the world. Then I will introduce uh, the impact of the digital mediascape uh, with our relationship to images. And I will introduce you uh, uh, to the notion of the skin screen and finally a few uh, of course, temporary uh, conclusions. Where does the word aesthetics come from? It comes from the old Greek aesthesis, 
And aesthesis is the multimodal perception of the world through the senses, thus through the body. I fully endorse uh, a definition of aesthetics that was given recently by an American philosopher, Mark Johnson, uh, in his book, The Aesthetics of Meaning and Thought. Begin quote, aesthetics extends broadly to encompass all the processes by which we enact meaning through perception, bodily movement, feeling, and imagination. In other words- Excuse me, Vittorio, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, uh, so you're not sharing the, the presentation, so I just wanted to let you know that so you can share it. Oh, I, I think uh, I shared the, the, the screen. Uh, yeah, sorry. sorry. Okay. Okay. So let me go back. Um, you didn't miss uh, much so far in terms of images, although um, images will be uh, definitely relevant in my presentation. I was quoting from this book, The Aesthetics of Meaning and Thought, uh, from the philosopher Mark Johnson. And uh, the, the reason why I rely on this definition is because uh, it shows how closely related is the notion of aesthetics uh, as conceived as by Mark Johnson with the, uh, a basic dimension of our relation to the world. Aesthetics extends broadly to encompass all the processes by which we enact meaning through perception, bodily movement, feeling, and imagination. In other words, all meaningful experience is aesthetic experience. So this is um, the starting point, so to speak. So why do I speak of uh, the present world of the uh, aesthetic world? Uh, which means that aesthetics uh, um, is a, a crucial dimension in order to understand uh, where do we live and how our existence is uh, uh, shaped uh, by digital technology. Aesthetics is the key access point still poorly investigated to the understanding of how digital technologies shape our identity, our social relationship, and the world in which we live. The digital disintermediation of perception and the creation of meanings operated by the new media environment, the mediascape, have literally aestheticized the world. Aesthetics pervades all forms of social cognition. The impact that new digital technologies and the related social practices have on people's lives and on society are still poorly studied. So since the main topic uh, of my talk today will be our relation to images, uh, I want to propose you uh, a tentative answer uh, to this image. How do we aesthetize uh, uh, images. So how do we relate through our senses, through our body, uh, to images? And the questions are being asked to this specific object, which is the brain related to the body, intrinsically intertwined with the body. So whenever I refer to the brain, I always mean a brain um, uh, tightly connected with the body. Uh, that uh, plays the role of the brain's interface uh, to the world. So when we think of our relation to images, and particularly if we do so uh, starting from the brain, uh, we naturally uh, think that uh, uh, the brain answer to how do we uh, see images is through the activation of its visual part. So the idea would be that uh, we see the world uh, through the use of uh, uh, the visual part of the brain. I want to challenge uh, this view, which I have jokingly uh, uh, designate as the visual brain imperialism on, on vision. And uh, why do I uh, try to challenge this purely visual account of vision? Uh, well, uh, because uh, uh, through neuroscientific research in the last 30 years or so, or so uh, we understood that observing the world is more complex than the mere activation of the visual brain. Why? 
because vision is multimodal. It encompasses the activation of motor, somatosensory, touch-related, emotion-related brain networks. So vision is intrinsically synesthetic if we uh, try to uh, see it through what we learn about uh, brain function. Then I want to introduce you to uh, uh, an apparently um, counterintuitive notion of visual perception. That one of the key actor in our visual perception of the world is the motor system, is movement, is bodily movement. Why? Because we understood that the motor system in our brain can work uh, possibly in three different ways. Uh, it can be activated to generate movement. It can be activated while we are observing movements performed by other individuals. And finally, it can be activated when we merely imagine to move. In both the last int instances, when we see someone acting or when we imagine acting, our body is still, but uh, nevertheless, uh, a consistent part of the uh, brain motor system is pretty much active. So the motor system can be active and produce movement, but at the same time, uh, the motor system can do other things. It can be active while simulating movement. And this simulation can be voluntarily activated when we imagine moving, or it can be uh, externally generated when we uh, observe someone moving. Frontal and parietal areas are fully integrated by a set of uh, uh, reciprocal connections that define uh, a multiplicity of parallel parietal premotor networks. They contain uh, neurons that have motor properties when they fire, as we say, they generate movement, but they also, the, the very same motor neuron respond also to sensory uh, stimuli, tactile stimuli, auditory stimuli, uh, visual stimuli. Thus, frontomotor parietal areas are neural integrated, not only to control movement and action, but also to serve the function of building an integrated bodily formatted mapping of actions, objects, and location uh, in the surrounding of our body, what we define as peripersonal space, the, the space that can be reached while we'll uh, uh, stretch out our um, uh, forking. So if every experience of the world is uh, uh, bodily driven, uh, um, it depends on a, a multi-sensory integration. Thus, it is an aesthetic experience. Um, a second hypothesis I want to offer you uh, is the following. Whenever we relate uh, to man-made images, say a painting, uh, a sculpture, a fresco, uh, a movie, whatever, be it still or a moving image, Anytime we relate with uh, those images, at the same time, we entertain an intersubjective uh, relationship. The image is the go-between, the mediator between a trans-individual uh, relationship. The relationship, for example, when I behold a, a painting between the artist, uh, the individual who created that image, and me, the beholder, who through the mediation of the object uh, relate to another subject. And my peculiar take uh, on intersubjectivity is to focus on its bodily dimension. Again, as with the uh, relation to images, uh, we can relate to others in a variety of ways uh, that we may like to define more or less commonly. Although, I, I don't fully endorse this sharp distinction between what is taken to be uh, cognitive, 100% cognitive, and everything else is non-cognitive. I think cognition is a very complex enterprise uh, 
And it's hard for me to draw a line in the brain and say, what's going on here is non-cognitive. What's going on there? Possibly the more anterior you go, it is supposed to get more cognitive. <laughs> I think it's, it's quite funny uh, to see things uh, in this uh, rather uh, uh, dichotomous way. But I, I, of course, there is language. Uh, uh, there are very sophisticated and metacognitive ways to relate to others. So uh, I want to be clear. I'm not saying that intersubjectivity only amounts to mirror neurons uh, uh, or uh, the intercorporeal side. My point is that this dimension of social cognition has been neglected for many years now. Uh, uh, it is finally being uh, properly addressed and is something that we cannot leave out of the picture if we want uh, to speak uh, about uh, our relation to others and as we are doing today, our relation to images. So let me briefly introduce mirror neurons. Uh, they are uh, nowadays uh, hotly debated, uh, uh, I think mostly uh, because of big misunderstanding. I mean, uh, mirror neurons do not see the world. They don't understand anything. They don't interpret reality. They don't feel emotion like every other uh, 100 uh, billions neuron sitting in our brain. Uh, neurons, to put it uh, uh, more clearly, are not epistemic agents. Thus, not even mirror neurons are epistemic agents. Uh, they are excitable cells. Their only language is action potential. Through these action potentials, something happens. Uh, you may call it our mind, our consciousness. And we don't know exactly how uh, from this electricity uh, emerges uh, our uh, lively experience of the world, like your experience uh, of listening uh, to my words now and looking at uh, my shared screen. So why mirror neurons are important? They are important because they reveal the, for the first time, a neurophysiological mechanism uh, that shows a, a, a double uh, way of functioning of the motor system. The neuron fires, movement is produced. The movement fires, no movement is produced, but it's a reaction to the movement of someone else. So it emphasizes the perceptual role of the motor system, but it does so connecting uh, two individuals, the observer and uh, the agent being observed uh, are both equipped with a mechanism that uh, uh, has the possibility, the potentiality of mapping the movement of the other onto the very same neural machinery that normally enable the observer to produce similar actions. So the same neuron that fires when the agent performs the action also fires when uh, it uh, observes someone else performing a similar action. A more recent experiment done by our colleagues in Tübingen University in the lab of Peter Thier uh, have done something very interesting. They compare the discharge of mirror neurons when the action is uh, observed being physically executed, uh, performed uh, by a human agent in front of uh, the macaque with a situation where the macaque is like going to the movie, uh, so to speak. Uh, he watches uh, the same action being displayed on a bidimensional computer screen. So first interesting result, practically all mirror neurons recorded with this paradigm fire to both. Some of them equally, with equal strength. The, the orange curve uh, is the response of a, a mirror neuron when observing the uh, physical agent being present uh, two meters away. Uh, the black curve showed the discharge of the very same neuron when uh, the macaque uh, uh, observed the action on the computer monitor. The other half of the neuron prefer, so to speak, which means they discharge uh, more intensely uh, when watching the action being performed live uh, 
uh, by the agent, uh, but they still show uh, a very robust discharge uh, when watching the action uh, on the screen. Why I think these are results to be uh, important? Because they show that uh, in a non-human primate uh, species, which is uh, uh, distant from, from us approximately 25 million years in evolutionary time, well before the invention of language, there is a neurophysiological mechanism that treats reality and its representation, roughly speaking, uh, uh, in the same way. Of course, a macaque like us can tell the difference between the two situations. So clearly there are other uh, neurophysiological mechanisms that uh, kicks in here and not here and the other way around. So there has to be a neural correlate uh, which behave differently uh, in the two situation. If we believe, as I do, there is a close relationship between the experience we make of the world and the underpinning uh, uh, functionality of our brain. But I think it's remarkable that both situations share a common uh, neural uh, fingerprint, so to speak, which tell us a lot about how close the so-called physical reality and its representation are uh, if looked at uh, through uh, the lens, uh, the vantage point uh, of brain function. Let's move to our brain. Uh, these uh, colored uh, parts of our brain turn out to be activated both during the execution, the observation, and the imagination of goal-directed actions, communicative symbolic actions like waving goodbye and just simple uh, body movements. But this turned out to be just the tip of a much bigger iceberg. What, what I mean is that in the following years, uh, following uh, uh, an original hypothesis, uh, we decided to investigate whether similar mirroring mechanism could be detected also in the domain of emotions and sensation. And we were the first um, to demonstrate that, for example, uh, the same part of the brain that is active when you genuinely experience the, the feeling and the emotion of disgust is also activated when you witness uh, the disgust uh, um, on, on the facial expression of someone else. Similarly, uh, we were the first to demonstrate that the so far uh, considered a purely somatosensory tactile area, area S2 in the parietal opercular region becomes active both when our body is being touched, but also when we observe a, a similar part of the body of someone else being touched. So the mirror mechanism is wider than uh, the mirror neurons that we originally discovered in the macaque brain and that only related to uh, hand or mouth actions. It maps the sensory aspects of actions, emotions or sensations of another onto the perceiver's own neural mapping of that action, emotion or sensation. And this mapping enables one to perceive the action, emotion or sensation of another to a certain degree as if performing that action or experiencing some content of that emotion or sensation. Although, as I said, um, our motor system uh, is not mimicking, uh, unless in the case of emotion, where we can also see not just the simulation, but uh, the facial mimicry on the face of the observer when uh, uh, engaged in looking at someone uh, expressing a given emotion. As I said, uh, the very same simulation logic also applies uh, to imagination. Uh, several uh, experiments um, have revealed that the boundary between the real world and the imaginary or the imagined one is much less clear cut than one might think if we ask questions to, to the brain. Uh, from the pioneering work of uh, uh, Coslin, uh, we know that seeing and imagining to see, and from the pioneering work of Jean de Cetit, of Marc Genereau, we know that acting and imagining to act 
share the activation of parts of the same brain circuits. These double neural activation can be described in terms of neural reuse, like Michael Anderson would put it, or myself, I put it uh, uh, a few years ago, and the related notion of embodied simulation. So this shows how embodied simulation overcomes the notion of empathy. So there's much more than that in this neurophysiological mechanism that show uh, this uh, possibility to be used for uh, a variety of uh, uh, purposes. And each of these different purposes has a, a peculiar individual uh, experience uh, correlate. Embodied simulation provides uh, a unified account of nonverbal, but also verbal, I, I, I don't have time, of course, to cover language uh, today, aspects of interpersonal relations that likely play an important role in shaping the self, its identity, and shared cultural practices. Embodied simulation reveals a unified functional mechanism that connects reality with imaginary and fictional worlds and links at the functional level, symbol making and symbol reception. So why homo duplex? Because self and other are reciprocally connected and interdependent, uh, which means that there's no self without another and there's no other without a self. Are, are two, two faces of the same coin. They co-determine one another. They are inti intimately related and you can have one without the other. But there's another duplicity, uh, which is strikingly important when we think about ourselves. What does it mean being human? Uh, the relation of the self to the par parallel worlds of representation. Since uh, we have uh, uh, a material memory of our past, this past is uh, telling us that we are literally obsessed to reproduce, to represent the world, be it with uh, paintings like this beautiful uh, paleolithic uh, uh, naturalistic images in, in the belly of the mountains in the south of France, in the south of Spain, but all over the world. This is uh, the more we uh, discover, uh, the more we study, the more we discover the, the, the pervasiveness of this obsession with probably multiple origin of this uh, creativity. Um, uh, we are obsessed of merging uh, ourselves with the animals uh, uh, to create a diffusion like this kind of uh, uh, lion mensch uh, um, found uh, uh, also from the Paleolithic age uh, in Germany. We are obsessed by images, we are obsessed by uh, telling stories and listening to stories. Uh, we invent uh, uh, writing uh, so that these stories uh, can be written and read. Uh, we invented the parallel world of photography, cinema, television, smartphones, virtual reality, and we don't know what the, the future uh, will, will bring, but the common denominator is that we are not just happy uh, with the physical reality, we are obsessed with duplicating it, reproducing it, representing it. And we are perfectly at home in all of these parallel worlds. Since we, uh, this aesthetic dimension of, of, uh, of human nature, uh, of human culture, we could say that it's nature uh, um, uh, for humans uh, to develop this specific uh, kind of cultural activities uh, in 2007, with the art historian David Friedberg, we proposed uh, uh, this hypothesis. In order to understand our relation to man-made images, those particular kind of man-made images that we now define as art, which is a, a very short uh, life, historically speaking, this definition, although it's much older, our obsession in producing and beholding images, we wanted to uh, rescue uh, within this discourse, the role of the body, the role of movement, the role of emotion, the role of Einfühlung, the role of empathy. And we said, well, in order to understand how we relate to art, I think that a smart move would be to bracket 
the artistic dimension of visual works of art and focus on the embodied phenomena that are induced in the course of contemplating such works of art by virtue of their visual content. And we propose that embodied simulation, the variety of mechanisms I briefly sketched for you in the, in the previous slides, might underpin the empathetic power of images, uh, the power that images exert on us. Uh, and that power is so strong that some, sometimes human beings feel compelled to destroy those images, like blowing up sculpture, temples, uh, uh, canceling uh, uh, human faces uh, uh, from paintings, from frescoes. Uh, iconoclasm uh, is, uh, goes hand in hand uh, with our obsession in making images uh, and watching them. So we are obsessed in making images, but also in, in destroying them because they are so powerful. So this experimental aesthetic, uh, uh, we believe and we still believe uh, that article set the agenda for uh, a series of uh, experiments that we, we have been doing and we still keep doing. The experience of images can be empirically studied to reveal its bodily and neurobiological grounding elements. And these data can fuel the theoretical uh, debate in the philosophy of images, uh, in aesthetics, uh, and in uh, media studies. Uh, perhaps by this approach, we can get uh, a better understanding of what the concepts that refers to aesthetics and art are made of. So we, we started doing experiments on abstract art. For example, the first experiment was on Lucio Fontana's cut. Then came uh, the brush strokes of Franz Klein. And we were able to demonstrate that when we behold those images, uh, um, those works of art, uh, um, in spite of the fact that our uh, uh, body is still, our motor system simulate the gesture that produced those very same images. Uh, then we moved on to uh, movies and all of these experiments are uh, uh, described and, and discussed uh, in a book I, really, uh, I recently uh, published with Michele Guerra, The Empathic Screen. So I don't have time to go into the details uh, of this experiment, but we were uh, willing to study parts of the power of moving images or film, studying um, uh, camera movements. Um, and we were able to show, for example, that when you watch a, a movie scene filmed with a Steadicam, so a camera which is uh, 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 wrapped around the body of the cameraman, and you have the feeling of uh, being part of the scene is because you, your motor system is walking along with the body of the cameraman simulating uh, uh, his walk. Uh, we also demonstrate uh, that uh, uh, part of uh, uh, the uh, uneasiness we feel when uh, editing is not done in a, in a continuous mode, but with jump cuts, um, this perceptual uneasiness uh, uh, um, is underpinned by uh, uh, the detection of uh, anomalies in our brain at the level of the sensory motor system. But now let me focus in the last part of my talk uh, of uh, the digital parallel worlds that are taking more and more uh, of our uh, reality experience, even more so after the uh, COVID-19 pandemic erupted. Uh, I spent uh, um, uh, three months and a half totally locked down uh, at my place in Parma, Italy, during the first wave that here hit pretty hard. We had thousands of deaths in my city. Nobody was allowed to uh, leave uh, his place only for uh, uh, food uh, supply. So it was really hard and all the world was uh, just within the frame of my desktop. And I spent hours uh, uh, in front of my desktop. So this is a kind of a, a boost of a common uh, a practice we all entertained uh, well before uh, the epidemic erupted. Uh, we all spent more and more time watching the screen. Uh, and this uh, attitude uh, got its biggest boost in 2007 after the introduction of smartphones. But 
people started thinking about the relationship between technology and cognition uh, a long time ago. And I want to quote uh, a French philosopher, Gilbert Simondon, uh, who studied with uh, Merleau-Ponty. I think Merleau-Ponty was the supervisor of, of, of uh, his uh, PhD thesis. And what Simondon uh, wrote in the 50s and 60s is incredibly uh, modern. And uh, I think we should uh, uh, read him again. Technology exceeds any narrow utilitarian purpose. As technology expands, it produces new relations between people and things, between people and people, or between things and things. Technology is a network of relations. Far from marking our alienation from the natural world, technology is what mediates between humankind and nature. Here is his book that uh, I think was a re-elaboration of his doctoral uh, thesis. Uh, du mode d'existence des objets techniques. The technical object understood according to its essence, think about our mobile phone, the technical object such that it has been invented, conceived and desired and taken up by a human subject becomes the support and the symbol of that relation we want to call trans-individual. By the intermediary of the technical object, an interhuman relation is thus created that forms the very model of transindividuality. Well, more than 50 years before the iPhone was invented. And here is another uh, much uh, contemporary uh, 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 media theorist, Mark Hansen from Duke University. In his book written 20 years ago already, Embodying Techniques, he wrote, just as technological modernization produces a shift in the mode of experience from air farum, more related to language, to air ledness, more related to the body, it also brokers a shift in the medium of experience. We're not talking about uh, uh, um, very uh, abstract uh, academic notions. Now we are speaking about our experience of life, of the world from non-sensuous linguistic correspondences to embodied and practical mimetic activity. One, what one recent critic aptly calls contact sensuosity. The introduction of, of the new digital technologies overthrows language from the role played so far as the dominant carrier of the experience of reality, putting a new bodily non-linguistic visuality at the center of our experience of the world. The postmodern technological modernization paradoxically brings the body back at the center of the relationship with a reality which is increasingly mediated by digital interactive visual representations. Uh, so uh, what we see uh, is a relocation of the medium. As uh, uh, Francesco Casetti, film theorist uh, at Yale University, uh, uh, recently uh, um, uh, discussed. Re one example of relocation is uh, movies that from the cinema theater are relocated into television. Television is relocated uh, uh, on the web, uh, which is relocated uh, on the screen of my mobile phone. The concept of relocation makes clear, writes Cassetti, that the migration of a medium outside its prior terrain involves a type of experience in a physical or technological space. So through the means of relocation, namely of digital technology, uh, we are going to see a change of our experience of the world uh, a change of the technological space within which our experience of the world occurs. And when we think about uh, uh, the role of media in our society, as aptly put by the sociologist uh, uh, John Thompson, uh, recently this year in Theory, Culture and Society, uh, he wrote, if you want to understand communication media and their impact, you have to analyze them in relation to the kinds of action and interaction which they make possible and create. Communication media 
should not be analyzed on their own in terms of their intrinsic properties, but should be analyzed in relation to the forms of action and interaction which the use of communication media brings into being. And the interaction I want to end with is that allowed by our smartphone, which are all equipped with a touch screen, which I redesignate as the skin screen. The technological evolution of digital image reproduction, where the protagonist, as I said, is our smartphone, enabled the miniaturization of screens. A substantial part of human visual universe has been literally sucked under the surface of a multiplicity of portable screens as beautifully uh, uh, captured by this uh, uh, image of the uh, French artist Antoine Geiger. For the first time in the history of humanity, images are literally and always at our fingertips in a much more different ways with the relationship, uh, uh, with respect to what was possible before by bringing books along uh, with you. The images still or moving from remote that they were had entered forcefully inside our very personal space, remaining there for many hours every day. Think about where you are having the vast majority of your digital experience uh, during your daily routines. Whenever you look at uh, a mobile screen, be it a tablet or your mobile phone held between your hands, your perceptual experience uh, occurs within the peripersonal space. The space that you must safeguard from the intrusion of the virus, keeping uh, the other people uh, at a distance uh, of uh, uh, at least uh, one or two meters. Uh, it is the, uh, the peripersonal space is the very same space uh, that different culture um, norm uh, in terms of distances that uh, another person you're talking to uh, is allowed to, uh, to be with respect to you. Um, the domain of proschemics. Uh, uh, we Latin people tolerate uh, uh, shorter distances than people from the North do. Uh, so this is a space around our body, which is a, a very strong emotional investment. And it is exactly the space where our perceptual uh, experience of the world through digital mediation occurs. And, and this factor has not been um, entirely focused so far, neither experiment experimentally uh, nor uh, theoretically. The screen is no longer just a transparent medium. It becomes a techno body prosthesis since it is the body that constitutes performatively and in an analogical way, the triggering and stopping engine of the digital reproduction of images, thanks to the contact with the fingers of our hand. The screen assumes the appearance of a wrapping, a transparent skin constantly touched lightly by the fingers of the spectator. The screen becomes the skin screen. The haptic dimension of vision and the metaphorically prehensile characteristic of the eye Remember what, what Merleau-Ponty said, uh, uh, the eye that palpate uh, reality. Uh, this is not a metaphor anymore. It becomes literal. Contact is no longer sim simulated, but current. So this generates a lot of questions that we hope uh, in the coming days uh, uh, to address empirically. How much do bodily contacts with the screen condition our vision of the images? How does the intermittent opacification of the screen when we touch it, that makes it present as a screen, modulate our responses to images as spectators? And how much does it affect our empathic connection with the relocated fictional narratives we interact with or with the social communication that we entertain with others, like the one we are experiencing right now? Okay, I'm done. Man-made images are the locus of virtual interaction, constituting a sophisticated form of mediated intersubjectivity, 
and these elements are connected to the function of embodied simulation. The way through which beholders connect to images are not just offline mental processes, but primarily online bodily forms of intersubjectivity. The meaning of images does not depend only on concepts and proposition, which of course play a major role in our understanding of them, but it relies also on sensory motor schemas, which get the viewer literally in touch with them, shaping a multimodal form of embodied simulation, which exploits all the potentialities of our brain body. Embodied simulation as a model of perception and imagination generates, this is my hypothesis, of course, the peculiar quality of the embodied scene as that plays a significant role in aesthetic experience, not just of art, as I said from the very beginning, but with the, with the real uh, world through its digital mediation. It is one important ingredient of our appreciation of human creative expressions. The digital mediation of perception, meaning making and communication have become crucial during the COVID-19 pandemic. So they have overemphasized something that was present already before. And this I think requires a new empirical understanding and conceptualization of digital aesthetics to generate a new understanding of our societies. So my talk of today represent my attempt to, to move into the, uh, this direction. Our identity is the outcome of a series of basic modalities of openness to the world characterized by a finite set of desires and behaviors and one of the variously conscious experience feelings they generate. Sensory motor and affective bodily states and their underpinning neural mechanism not only provide the architectural background texture which enables the making of any historical self but also enable the identity externalization that characterizes the use of things and more recently of new digital media. The growing autonomy of the material digital world colonizes more and more our imagination while outsourcing our memories. The reality that we contemplate from the screens following us everywhere shapes our take on reality. Neuroscience can- Apologies, Vitor, we have two more minutes, okay? Okay, I'm done. Neuroscience can help us to deconstruct and understand the ways in which the body interface with the real world and with the digitized world. It can reveal the rules of the game, providing tools to design new contexts and new mediations. The intercorporeality implied by embodied simulation represents a, a valid starting point to analyze the mode of presence of digital images and to shed new light on viewers' responses to them. Thank you so much for your attention and I'm ready to take your questions if there are any. Thank you, Professor Galesa, for sharing your presentation with us. Moving to some questions. The first one is from Stevan Ramirez and it is, are there direct sensory inputs to the motor cortex without prior arrival at the sodom sensory cortex? Well, um, this is a very interesting point. Uh, uh, what we are learning particularly from non-human primates is that even the earliest stages uh, of processing, for example, take vision, uh, which um, uh, occur at the level of V1, the primary uh, visual area which sits at the back uh, of the occipital cortex, receive uh, uh, connections from sensory motor regions uh, in the parietal cortex. Uh, uh, the same occurs between the inferotemporal cortex and the parietal cortex. The inferotemporal cortex is supposed to be uh, the end of the game uh, in, in the so-called ventral or what stream uh, of visual processes, but it, it entertains uh, um, a variety of reciprocal connection with the sensory motor system. So, so I think it's hard to imagine a just purely uh, sensor, uh, sensory region uh, in our brain. I think the multimodal integration is not the exception, it's the rule. Okay, thank you. Then uh, we have another question and it's uh, more related to the instruments used for assessing aesthetic experience. Um, do you like recommend um, 
like certain type of instruments for like they're are better for assessing uh, aesthetic to study, experience? To study, to study aesthetic experience, there are many questions that you can ask. Uh, and um, hence, there are uh, um, uh, a number of parallel technological solutions. So first, uh, the simplest one is to study how people explore the image. So you can use uh, an eye tracking device, infrared camera. It's, 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 uh, it's quite cheap. Uh, it's probably the cheapest solution. Or you may be willing to study uh, the emotional reaction uh, of the beholder, and you can do it in a variety of ways. You can, for example, record with thermal imaging uh, the variation of blood flow uh, on the skin of the face, which indirectly tells you about the autonomic reaction, so the affective part of the response. Or you can directly record uh, from the facial muscles by using uh, uh, electromyography. Finally, you can ask question uh, uh, to the heart. You can record electrocardiogram, which also give you uh, um, something about uh, uh, the emotional response. Uh, colleagues in Frankfurt uh, at the Max Planck Institute for Empirical Aesthetics, they record even goosebumps. Uh, they created a small camera that can be applied on the skin so while you read a poem, if you have goosebumps, they can tell you when exactly do those happen. And finally, you can record the brain activity by mean of EEG and by mean of fMRI. And if you stick to EEG with wireless devices, you can even record the, from the brain uh, uh, outside the lab, say in a museum or in a concert hall. So there are a variety of possibilities. Thank you. Thank you. Um, moving on to another question. Uh, could exposure to screens such as TV, tablets, PC, mobile phones affect the neurodevelopment of language, taking into account that, that this has a representational part of the image? Well, uh, the short answer is I don't know because I'm not an expert in neurodevelopment and uh, I, um, I haven't read this literature recently, so I don't know. What I believe uh, um, it is easy uh, to be hypothesized uh, is that, uh, and I, I don't mean to, uh, to give it a, a positive or a negative uh, uh, value. I think, uh, of course, our brain is uh, highly plastic, uh, uh, so it is shaped uh, by our experience uh, as it uh, develops. So if our experience of the world is mostly through uh, screens and digital mediation, this uh, will have uh, uh, clearly an impact. Uh, um, for example, um, if, if you think about the pace at which uh, uh, feature movies are now being edited, uh, within a minute, there are far more shots now than there were uh, 30 or 40 years ago. So this sets us not only aesthetically, so if we see a movie of the 40s, my kids say, oh, but it's so boring, it's so slow, there's no action, there's nothing. Our attention uh, is uh, clearly influenced by this constant training on this rhythm, on this pace that is faster and faster and faster. And uh, I don't know if you noticed that, but if you read the text on the web, say in a newspaper website, now they tell you how long it will take you to read that article. Uh, because uh, if you are afraid it's too long, you won't read it. So they said, it will only take three minutes of your time, of your precious time. So you see, our experience of time is slowly but steadily modified by this technological uh, mediation. So I would say yes. Thank you. Uh, we have another question, um, and it's from Lina De Luque. Uh, she asks, is it possible to think that general development is altered with this new digital reality? No, well, I, I mean, that's, uh, that sounds a bit too far-fledged. Uh, um, uh, what, what do you mean? You mean in, in negatively um, video games or um, the usage of, of uh, digital devices uh, turn, turn out, uh, this lit I know some, some of this literature, turn out to be also, uh, there is a positive aspect too, 
I mean, um, for a variety of skills, uh, uh, kids learn them uh, much if they have some active video gaming. So it's all black and white. Uh, this is becoming, uh, particularly for digital natives, uh, um, um, a crucial part of their experience. Uh, uh, of can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, here's another question, and it is, how do blind people generate intersubjectivity and aesthetic experience? How do blind people? Question is about blind, blind people, people who cannot see. Correct. Uh, well, through all the other senses. Uh, once I was uh, at a uh, scientific meeting uh, in Cortona, which is a beautiful town in Tuscany, in Italy. It was organized by. So we had a one of the exercises of exploring the inner part of Cortona, uh, walking blind uh, for half an hour. And the group was led by a sculpture. And the idea was to experience without vision through our body and our moving in space, um, the space around us. And after a while, you need some adaptation. I mean, this is a situation which is not comparable to blindness. But just to give you an example of what I could experience myself, uh, even when the pride of, of vision, I mean, you uh, rather quickly, I would add, uh, you, you, you exploit the other sources of relation to the world through the skin, the temperature, the pressure of the air, uh, the echoes of your steps. Uh, uh, um, according to the environment uh, that sends you back, the sounds of your step, uh, you develop an experience of, uh, 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 of an environment around your body, which is a lot more than a black uh, blank slate. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time. So the questions that are left, I remind the audience that you can make them through the chat of the event or you can schedule a meeting with the panelists. And you can make that in the participant section located on the left of your screen of the event. And uh, once again, I thank you, Professor Galesa, for sharing your presentation with us. Okay. Uh, finally. <laughs> Goodbye. 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 I want to also inform all of you that the speaker leading the following open science session unfortunately won't be able to join us because of the health issues. We wish Victor a quick recovery and we would like to inform you that he will record the session for later publication. We invite you, however, to join the space. It will now be led by the president of our scientific committee. He's Dr. Juan David Leon Gomez, who will be sharing his great experience about statistical analysis and our programming software. Thank you again for joining us, and I hope you can have a great day and that you can enjoy the other program events. Have a great day.